Well, hello everyone and welcome back to the channel and to something slightly different today. Now, I do try and avoid making these sort of sit down at home looking at a laptop videos. However, at the moment, I'm in a little bit of a predicament where my Volvo XC90 is away for some repairs and hopefully we're gonna be getting that car through its MOT, but I haven't got anything to update you on yet. I thought the car would probably be back by now. It's been away, well, almost three weeks and it's still not done. So I've got a little bit of a gap in content where I don't have the Volvo XC90 to film with. And so I thought I'd do something a little bit interesting that I've been looking into quite a lot recently. And it is buying a winter car. Okay, I've got the Volvo XC90, but that's been my project car. I actually want a daily car to replace my Audi TT, which is gonna be going up for sale. And this week uh, we've got some snow forecast and it's just really time that I, I get something. The one car I'm really after because I've wanted one of these for a while and I've never owned one is a 955 or the first generation Porsche KN. I'm not that fussed on the engine. Ideally a turbo would be nice but you pay a premium for those. Then there's the 4.5 which is the KN S and then there's the 3.2 which before I was always like no it's way too underpowered. However, actually, I'd be very happy with a 3.2 as well. But the problem that I keep falling into is I find all these KNs and then I just think, oh, but for that money, I could have a Range Rover. And then I get into that big, deep rabbit hole of looking at L322 Range Rovers. So this is a little bit of a self-help video where I'm hoping I can gain some of your input. We're going to look at some Porsche KNs on the market and some L322 Range Rovers compare what you get with both of them, do a little bit of comparison with the two cars, I suppose. And I'd really appreciate your advice on what I'm looking at and whether you think ultimately I should pull the trigger on a 955KN or I should go and buy an L322 Range Rover. Now I'm gonna use Auto Trader for the purpose of this video, although having said that, I do browse plenty of other places when looking at cars for sale. eBay, Facebook Marketplace, although that has just become a complete scam site now so decreasingly so collecting cars the auction platform as well as car and classic the, those four or five places i check daily actually it's, it's quite concerning but we're going to use auto trader because it sort of gives us a flat basis to compare cars so uh, i'm looking at l322 range rovers my budget absolute max is about ten thousand pounds so i'm just going to put that as a max price it's always good to put a slightly higher budget than what you have because there's always negotiating you've got to factor in as well. So for cars advertised at 10,000 pounds, I might offer 8,000 pounds for it and then end up buying it at nine, depending on the car. But if you've only got nine grand, for example, as your absolute max budget, you should put 10,000 pounds in when you're searching for cars to allow some wiggle room for negotiating. So here we go, Range Rover, max 10,000 pounds. Now, ideally, I'd want a petrol Range Rover and not because I think they're better than the diesels, but unfortunately, because my parents live in the new ULEZ zone, which is the ultra low emission zone, which is a charging zone. If you're to drive into it each 12 hours, you pay £12.50. So, for example, if I was to go drive to my parents' house and stay the night and then come home the next morning, it would cost me £25 to drive a diesel Range Rover into the zone, unless that car is from late 2015 onwards but obviously L322 is only up to 2012. So my absolute dream would be a five litre supercharged Range Rover, but at 10,000 pounds, you're gonna to struggle to get one that's worth buying. So for now, we're just gonna look at all cars and I like to filter it by most recent to see what's come on the market today. And actually straight away, that's one I've not seen before. Uh, it's a 4.4 BMW V8, because it's a 2003 and it's got the original boxy lights like my old L322 and the best grill I think that just four slatted very simple grill that came on those early cars it looks really clean actually it's a shame that it's a silver with a black interior I dream of having something a bit more extravagant than that maybe a nice blue or a green exterior with a cream or tan interior that would probably be my ideal but to be honest when it comes to these old L322s I would sacrifice my dream spec to have something that's actually been well looked after and isn't going to spend the majority of the winter not being used because it's in a, in a workshop or broken down in my driveway I might just check the MOT history on it that's always a really useful and free way to get an indication of how the car's been looked after if you see recurring advisories over and over and over and over again, year after year, it gives you a really nice indication that either it's been passed around like a parcel at Christmas or it's just not being maintained. They've just neglected those advisories that keep going up and up and up and they're much more likely then to become 
big problems. The other thing I'd strongly recommend, and this is something I do for every single car that I'm considering buying now, is doing a car vertical check. Now where the MOT history online can give you some indication of the car's past, car vertical can go into so much more detail, explaining things to you like whether it's ever been involved in an accident. And sometimes when they have been involved in an accident, there's even photos there of the car in its damaged state. You can see whether the car has been clocked, whether it's been stolen, whether there's any outstanding finance on it, and much, much more. So in this scenario, we're looking at Porsche KNs, and this one came up, which is clearly not one to buy. On the face of it, it might seem like quite a nice car now. It's all repaired and being sold, but as we can see, it was damaged here, and there's photos to show for it. So that's going to tell you straight away, it's probably a car you don't want to be buying. But more commonly, you'll see things that have outstanding finance, or interesting mileage history. Cars do still get clocks these days. And so Car Vertical is an essential partner to have when you're buying a car. So if you want to use Car Vertical for purchasing your next car, do use the link in the description for a discount. Some details on screen as well. Thank you so much to Car Vertical for sponsoring this video. So we can see it did fail an MOT in April of this year on front lower suspension arm ball joint dust cover, no longer progressing. Okay, and <laughs> as with all 4.4 V8 Range Rovers, the BMW ones at least, every single one you look at in the monitor and repair if necessary has oil leak, but not excessive. They do suffer from oil leaks, these BMW engines, but I did have one for about two years and had no issues with the engine to speak of. Everything else around it failed, and I did get the rocker cover gas gaskets done on that car. But So I have to say, if we're ignoring the less than ideal spec of the car, this silver one at 5950 is quite nice. There are now lots of 4.4 TD V8 cars that come within that £10,000 budget now. Uh, this is a fairly recent thing. I mean, they've always been around, but it's now frequently they're priced between seven and eight thousand pounds. And I'd imagine you could snap them up for a little bit less than that because I see lots of them remaining on Auto Trader for, for months actually. And I think one of the reasons for that is the same reason that I'm trying to avoid diesel cars, which is ULEZ. I think there's lots of people living in the now new ULEZ zone with these cars. And I can understand that if you're having to drive every single day within the zone and paying £12.50, well then that becomes a different story altogether. And so lots of people are trying to get rid of these cars at the moment and not so many people are wanting to buy them. But someone like me, who doesn't have to go into that area every single day, could pick up a bargain. This one here is a Vogue SE from 2011. These 4.4 TDV8s, I think, start around 2010, late 2010. They had a ZF8 speed gearbox, so all of the L322s other than this 4.4 TDV8 had a 6 or a 5 speed. Even the 3.6 TDV8s that got facelifted as well never benefited from the eight speed and neither did the five litre supercharged car. So that is something that's gonna improve your fuel economy, uh, the refinement just levels driving on the motorway, be a bit quieter with, with eight gears, lower revs. And um, they're just an all round brilliant car. I've only driven one of these actually, and it was when I did a video with Matt uh, from High Peak Autos. This is my 2002 slash 2003 Range Rover HSE. This is a 2012 Range Rover Westminster. And this, is Matt from High Peak Autos. We jumped in, we did a bit of a comparison, I think. We jumped in my then Jiveny Green V8 car, petrol, and I drove one of his 2011 or 2012 TDV8 West Ministers that he had in, in stock at the time. And I just remember it feeling, compared to that 2003 car I had, just incredibly refined. And to be honest, despite what we're talking about in this video, if you can pick one of these up in good condition for under £10,000. It's incredible. But let's look at this one then. This is a 2011 car. It's got 142,000 miles on it, which is not too bad at all. I'm replacing my TT, which has 140,000 miles on it, so I'm not losing anything there. This one looks particularly well specced. It's a Vogue SE, which is already quite good because it means you have heated and cooled seats in the front. You can always tell it's a Vogue when it doesn't have Let's see if I can show you actually. This is really sad. Yes, so these two buttons here, these two round dials, this is for your heated and cooled seats. And if it doesn't have these buttons, it's just a blank space next to the clock either side. 
and your heated seats are up on the climate control buttons here. And it, it means it's not a, a Vogue SE basically and that you don't have cooled seats. But anyway, this one does have cooled seats and what I'm most excited about is it has deployable side steps. My first car, my green Range Rover had fixed side steps, which were really useful, made getting into the car and out of the car pretty easy. But I never liked the way they look on the car. It just makes it look a bit messy. And then I had a, a gray Vogue SE, a 2008 car, which had no side steps. And although it looked much better, it was actually quite tricky to get in and out of. And you found yourself slipping off the seat every time you wanted to get out of the car, which you're conscious of is probably causing lots of wear to the bolsters. So in, in short terms, I'd love deployable side steps because it's the best of both worlds. You get the side step when you want it, but when you're not using them, they're not out. I suppose it doesn't really matter, does it? Because when you're driving the car, you don't even see the side steps anyway. But I just think they look better and it's something to, to look out for. So they're quite a rare option. You don't see many of them, to be honest, with deployable side steps. So that already puts this one well up in my estimations, as does the fact it doesn't have privacy glass. I think that's always a big win on these Range Rovers. It just makes them look makes them look much more tasteful. And I don't believe the Queen had any privacy glass on, on her personal Range Rovers. So if she didn't like the way it looked, then neither do I. And um, that's really nice, actually. I, don't, I can't tell if it's black or like a really dark blue. It says black here. And black interior, again, my least ideal spec. But th this is more of a... I mean, I say this, but I do get attached to cars. This is to replace my Audi TT for the winter. I waffle a lot here, but this is this is pretty nice, isn't it, this one? Uh, I haven't read the description. It just says, selling due to being offered a newer one for the right money. Someone will be getting a proper lot of car. Next MOT, August next year. So that's a real bonus. Let's, you know what, let's just have a quick look at the MOT history. Interesting. So its last MOT fail was in 2019, failed on suspension arms. Okay, so those, those repair immediately were repaired in 2019. They didn't do anything with the advisories. Then it passed in 2021. Again, a two year gap, that's really strange, with no advisories. And then 25,000 miles and a year later, it passed again with some advisories for the tires and some suspension arms again. So that implies to me that whoever did this MOT in 2021 was a friendly MOT center, because you wouldn't have suspension arm worn advisories in 2019 nothing in 2021 and then suspension arms worn again in 2022 it had done 30,000 miles in that time so i suppose it's possible but to me that just looks like someone passed it through who was a friend or i don't know uh, this one genuinely looks quite clean i'm gonna actually i'm not signed in oh i am signed in i'm gonna save that because where is it as well telford 93 miles away so it's a bit of a trek and it's only just been put up today because it wasn't on there yesterday when I was last doing this so uh, that is an interesting one I'm going to come back to once I finish this video because yeah I mean like I say it's not the color or anything I'd want but this isn't going to be my permanent car this is just got to get me through till April let's say but I just fear if I do end up with another Range Rover, I'll just get so attached to it and I won't want to get rid of it because they are just so good. This one I saw, I think it was, was it an import? This one, I can't remember. It was a 4.2 V8 supercharged car. Lots of people say they're the most reliable, or I'd say the least unreliable of the early bunch of cars. And I would be very intrigued to try one. I've never driven one certainly never owned one. And they all have slightly interesting, but normally quite good specs on them. I think the supercharged from factory were basically specced up with everything. They had these, this Harman Kardon sound system, which you can always tell it's a supercharged because the speakers are different. And you can see the small circular ones in the doors. I think Range Rovers look really good in white as well. It's a color then they're not normally in, especially the earlier L322s. You see more of the later ones in white, but I think the L322s kind of look really, it's a terrible word, but baller. They do, they do look really baller if you have a white Range Rover, I think. As long as it doesn't have black wheels on it. If you put black wheels on a white Range Rover, it all of a sudden looks a bit council estate. If I'm allowed to say that in 2023, I don't know. But it does, I'm afraid. Um, this white one with silver wheels, ignoring the black strips on the side, which are hideous, um, looks pretty smart, doesn't it? 4,890 quid with three months warranty, apparently. You know what? I'm always instantly turned off when it's a Range Rover being sold by a dealer. 
one of the Range Rovers I did buy was from a dealer. Well, they both were technically, but the second one I bought was from a dealer, and he was a dodgy dealer because I paid. I over, I got so excited. I went to see this this car. I paid what he asked for it, and I also then paid extra for warranty. I paid, I think, £7,250 in total for this 2008 Range Rover 3.6 TDV8, and it had 130,000 miles in it or something. Now that would be a four grand car, like especially since the ULEZ, that would be a four grand car at best. So I, I just, at the time it wasn't completely overpriced, but it was still strong money for, for one of those. And yeah, like literally within a week, it had a transmission fault. And actually, no, the first day I remember because I drove my mates and I to, we went to Wembley for an England game. So this was probably back in 2021. I can't remember what the England game was exactly, but we went to Wembley for this game. I remember getting back in the car. Um, day I bought it, back in the car, transmission fault, something, something, something. And I just went, for goodness sake. And so the next day I was on the phone to the guy I bought it from um, and he was just the least useful person. Um, just a typical dodgy dealer. Um, also the dealership I bought it from, the address for it, which I drove to, was just a house on a residential street. It was obviously his house. And then we had to drive five minutes to this car park right by a train line. Cars were filthy, just very strange. And even when I was like trying the air suspension in the car, when I first looked at it, before I took it on a drive, he was saying, why are you doing that? You're, you're never gonna use the suspension. You, you, are you a farmer? I'm like, well, one, I do use the suspension because I'm a weirdo and I like to put it in access mode every time I get out of the car. And two, obviously I'm gonna check that everything's working on a car I'm about to buy. Um, so I, I shouldn't have bought that car. It was just warning sign after warning sign. And uh, within a couple of weeks, a bunch of other stuff had gone. The, the engine had gone into limp mode it was leaking various fluids. There was a bunch of problems with that car. I should never have bought it. And when I did try and claim on my warranty or uh, ultimately reject the car, he just completely ghosted me and I didn't get anything back from him. Left a bad Google review, got the car fixed and I was just left with it. But yeah, uh, I can't remember where um, my point was. My point was that I try and avoid dealers when buying these L322s. And it's not just because I've had one bad experience, but I think on a more logical scale, a car like these L322s, they are fragile little sausages, these cars. They need pampering, um, but what's most important it is the history and how they've been used. And I think if you're buying one of these from a dealer like this one that's £4,800, it's quite well priced, which implies to me it's probably come from somewhere like Copart or a dealer auction or a Part X but most likely it's come from an auction somewhere, been cleaned, had a code reader run on it and the code's cleared, uh, MOT, and then they're selling it. But I'd always much prefer to buy something like that last one we looked at, the 4.4 the TDV8, which is a private sale, a few owners, and they can tell you that, you know, I had the window switches replaced in 2018 that cost me 84 quid and I, had it done by a bloke called Gary at this specialist that I've used for 10 years. You know, I'd much rather buy privately in this case. So um, let's look at one more Range Rover. I know we're not getting through these very fast at all, are we? This is a hideously overpriced one. Sorry to just out people like that, but this is a three litre TD6, which is the least desirable. It's not ULEZ exempt. They're, they're notoriously underpowered. Granted, I've not actually driven one of these, but this is 7,000 pounds. Has got a nice interior, but it's 110,000 miles and no description. That really annoys me, that. Why is there no description? Is it a dealer? No, there's a phone number. Private seller, there's a, there's a phone number. I should just pick up the phone if I'm interested, but it just says black. Like, give me some information and also, three photos. One of them's on its side like this and it's really bad quality. Got one of the front of the car and it looks like it's got a aftermarket grill on it, which is disgusting. And then another one of the interior where I can see a manky tissue. Uh, the rear seat is folded down, which just doesn't look particularly good. And it looks very grubby. It doesn't look like it's been cleaned for these photos, which is the least you can do. So it's priced high uh, because it's a three litre TD6. It's got 110,000 miles and the photos are, are shocking. I mean, I just don't, and then there's no description. If you're gonna like not post many photos, I want you to describe the car in your words. Give me a bunch of information about it. I find eBay is actually generally quite a good place for 
buying these Range Rovers because it tends to be more private sellers and enthusiasts use eBay to sell these cars. These are interesting, these nice facelift 3.6 TDB8. So this one's priced at nine and a half thousand, which is quite strong, but it's because it's only got 89,000 miles on the clock. So it's not completely unreasonable. So this one looks quite nice. And I have learned really that if you're trying to buy a cheap Range Rover, you're, you're buying the wrong car. If you're coming in to buy an L322, you need to be buying like the best one you can possibly find. And if that's gonna cost you more than you've got, then you need to save some money. Um, so yeah, here we go. This is a Vogue obviously because as I mentioned earlier, you can't, that, well, there's no buttons here. It's just blank. This one is quite high price, but it's, it's 89,000 miles and it does look good from the photos. Now let's see what the description is. See, this is already looking a lot better. The top line is, this is a much loved car that's been with us for seven years, next MOT due January. So that's not ideal, that would put me off, but the description, just, just saying we've had this car for seven years and it has been really reliable, straight away, this is top of the list because I've got something to vouch for there. So that's really nice. Um, there's nothing else to go off here, really. I could look at the MOT history, but I want to move on to Porsche KNs. Uh, I will just say on the L322s, I personally prefer the look of the earlier ones with the original interior and everything. But one thing that these later cars do have as an option on them, which is really attractive to me, especially as a daily driver, is adaptive cruise control. That was only available on cars that came as a facelift, so late 2009. And I can't tell if this car has it because of the photos. It's another bit of a pet hate of mine actually is, I can't quite, the adaptive cruise control is just behind these buttons here, but I, I can't see if this car has it because it's, it's not been photographed. Really interesting. Okay, there's some good Range Rovers to look at. Like I say, if I end up buying one, it'll probably be off eBay or somewhere like that. There's all sorts here, yeah, there's all sorts available actually. It's a good time to buy a Range Rover. The other thing I will just quickly say on L322s is L405s have taken an even bigger dump in pricing. And that's probably the biggest problem with these cars now. For example, if and when I come to get my five litre supercharged L322, I'd want to spend about 15 to 16 grand. I think that's the sweet spot really. That'll get you one around 100,000 miles with good history. Problem is, for 15 or 16 grand, you can now get into a diesel L405 with a little over 100,000 miles, which is crazy to be honest. I mean, that is a lot of car for the money. And the L405, in a lot of ways, is infinitely better than the L322, not least because it's just much lighter and much more efficient. You can even get five litre supercharged L405s for mid 20s if not low 20s at times so it makes it increasingly more silly to buy a a nice l322 because you just spend a tiny bit more you'd be in an l405 but i think at this price point under 10 grand we can still pick up some bargains i think the sweet spot is probably getting yourself a 4.4 tdv8 for around eight or nine thousand pounds with around a hundred thousand miles in it that's been looked after i think that's a really good place to put your money. So I've just seen this one, 3.6 TDV8, but it's in this gorgeous color with cream interior and it looks really mint actually. Oh, okay, it's not mint. Oh, and it's got such a, oh no, 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 no. no. Look at the state of that. that. Oh my goodness. I, you couldn't pay me to buy that car. Goodness me, who's done that? Poor car. Look at the state of that. Oh. They've put in a, obviously they've put in an aftermarket thing so they can have Apple CarPlay, fine, but you can get ones that actually fit into the original head unit. That just looks hideous. Sorry, if I did end up buying this car, I would be putting in an original head unit. That is just devastating, absolutely devastating. I would love to do a series, maybe one day when I've got a big shed and a lot of money to waste where I just go onto Auto Trader, I buy all of the L322s that have got stupid privacy glass, aftermarket head units, aftermarket grills, those horrible, um, like, what are they called? Like wind deflectors that go on your windows. All of it, the chrome, the chrome wing mirrors, all of that stuff. I'm just gonna buy every single car that's got anything like that, put it back to factory and how it should be, and then, sell it or, or just keep them in a shed ideally let's move on to porsche kns because i realized this this video is going to be like a few years long porsche cayenne 
up to ten thousand pounds and let's go on most recent i mean i admit i've checked this already this morning uh 3.2 v6 tiptronic with 109,000 miles at four grand nice if it's a good car that's a really good price but it's lpg so that's just an instant no for me i just i just i'm sorry but i understand if you lpg your car because obviously it's going to save you money on fuel and i know it costs a few thousand pounds to do lpg but if you drive a lot of miles you'll make that money back pretty quickly but it's just wrong you just can't do that to a poor old car it wasn't designed to be lpg and so it shouldn't be lpg i know that'll upset a lot of people who have lpg cars and think it's a great idea i just i would never buy one and i would never do it to a car and it's sorry that's a, such an awful thing to say because i do like modifying cars in certain ways but i'm just really anal and um yeah a bit on the spectrum about uh certain things i'm sure some of you know what i'm on about anyway but yeah just like those modifications and this one i've noticed actually does have another horrible aftermarket head unit uh, which i'm sure is much more functional than the original but i just can't i just not for me um so yeah it's lpg so i'm not interested then you know you can get 957 KNs within that 10 grand budget but for me and this is contrary to status quo I think I prefer the way that earlier cars look especially at the rear and again this is exactly the opposite of what most people say oh that's gorgeous oh this is the main attractor for me is a, a KN with a tan interior I mean that would pull me away from a lot of Range Rovers just look at that interior I know when you first set set your eyes on it it's ghastly I mean it is ghastly like look at the steering wheel with all those buttons but I've driven a few of these now and they are good you know they do feel they feel really they actually feel the most surprising thing is that when you get into a Cayenne I can only speak for an early 955 one it feels like super rugged a bit like an L322 you know it's a luxurious car and there's an element of sportiness in the Cayennes but they feel overridingly rugged and chunky and it's got these huge wing mirrors you've got a great view over the bonnet um, and the, the wheel and the dials are huge and it feels just really utilitarian. So let's just look. I mean, there's way less KNs on the market than uh, there are Range Rovers. And there's especially less nice ones on the market. And finding one with a tan interior as well is super rare. So I do get a little bit excited whenever one comes up. These are all facelift, facelift, facelift. This, oh, this, I haven't seen this one. Look at the color on that. Oh, and it's in Henley. It's just down the road. This is gorgeous. Oh, it's got an aftermarket head unit. Oh, why? This one, at least, this aftermarket head unit doesn't look terrible. But I just, just stop. Unless you're replacing it, like you're leaving the fascia and the thing as it is, and you're just upgrading the software. Sorry, this video wasn't meant to be me just moaning about listings on AutoTrader, but hopefully there's some entertainment value in that. It's a shame it's got a black interior. Imagine this with a tan interior. I have always thought about just buying one of these and then spending a grand on getting a new tan interior, but um, not a new tan interior, sorry, just a replacement interior that I can do. But it's just a bit complicated doing all the seats and then the dashboard <clears throat> and the headline, whatever it is. Um, it's probably just a little bit much for a car of this value, but that's a gorgeous color. If it is actually that color, that is really nice. And I'd almost have the black interior uh, what is it though? Is it a 4.5 S? So 340 horsepower. Um, sounds like they'd be quite quick, but they're not. From the ones I've driven, they're actually quite sluggish. Uh, but it's a petrol, of course, so um, they're not particularly talky. But it's a 4.5 V8. They sound great, these cars. They're pretty reliable. There's various things that can go wrong. But again, every single car has got common issues. Um, some are more expensive to fix than others. Some are more catastrophic than others. But I'm just never put off by anything that has issues like that. And you know, the worst case scenario is it breaks and you have to get it fixed. This one, great driving car used regularly over the last few years. That's a good thing. I'd always prefer something that's actually been used. Excellent service history, all Porsche or Porsche specialists except one. MOT'd and serviced in March. So it's got a few months MOT on it. It's got, yes, that's interesting actually. It's the high spec with air suspension, which most people would put them off, but I really want the air suspension. You can tell all cars have, have this. I think that's to do with the differential and the, the gearbox. Um, 
think that's your low range gearbox, which the early cars had. But here on the right, if it's got this um, second wheel, that's for your air suspension and this is for your suspension adaptive dampening. I think there's normal comfort and sport. I really want a car with with the, uh, with, with the air suspension. So that's a real big bonus actually. The mileage is good on this car, but let's just carry on with that description. The vehicle starts quickly first time, drives excellent, smooth gear changes, high spec model with air suspension, heated front and rear seats, sunroof upgraded. Yeah, I wish I didn't have that. Gosh, I wish I didn't have that. No engine warning light or anything serious, not since I've owned it, selling due to purchase of a new car. That sounds very reasonable to me. Don't, there's nothing suspicious uh, that would put me off from this car. This is definitely one to watch. I'm going to favourite that one, actually. It's funny because I've gone by most recent, but I haven't seen that one this morning and yesterday when I looked. Here's a bit weird. It's always worth checking and checking again with Auto Trader because it can be a little bit all over the place. This one's down the road as well. Um, really lovely. That's a really lovely looking one, isn't it? Oh, wish it had a tan interior. Yeah, so turbo. Uh, there are some turbos kicking around under 10 grand. Um, turbos did benefit from a much higher spec. They had, I think they had the extended leather as standard. They all had the air suspension as standard. And they also had a suede headliner as standard. Not to mention the engine um, was 110 horsepower more with because, because of the turbo. So it's still a 4.5, but it had 450 horsepower. And so the turbo is probably the one you want because you don't have to worry about the spec. You know it's got it all basically. Um, I do like the quad exhaust look at the, at the back and, and it's got this sort of bigger, uh, mouthier grille at the front, which I think looks really cool too. Uh, this one though, black on black, is just, yeah, like the least interesting one possible. 10 grand is quite, well actually it's got 67,000 miles. That's quite a nice car actually. There's not many KN turbos around with like less than 100,000 miles on them. Um, the, uh, there is this one actually, I'll show you guys this car, which I'm really tempted to go and buy because it happens to be just down the road from me. It's priced at three grand, which is the most attractive thing about it. And it's down the road. I actually bought the Jag from this dealership. So I know the guy that runs it, it was fine. You know, the Jags, well actually, Jag didn't turn out to be what it was sold as really, but I would buy from him again. Um, the, I just can't bring myself to do it because it's, again, silver with a black interior, which is, it doesn't get any more boring. And it's a 3.2 V6, which, okay, I'm not initially put off by, but it's the cheapest car and therefore the lowest spec to standard. And this one appears to have no options on it. It hasn't got the upgraded leather dash, which means it looks like an old Vauxhall Cavalier on the dash. It doesn't even have heated seats. It certainly doesn't have the air suspension or the adaptive dampers. Um, it has an aftermarket head unit, which looks nasty. Doesn't even have any fingertip controls and therefore I don't think it even has cruise control. Um, although that was a stalk, I think, on these cars, but it, I still don't think it has it. Um, and so I just, I think, although I just want a KN, this one is just a bit too lowly spec. It looks perfectly fine. I mean, like it's a bit dented and, um, you know, not in the best condition, but the interior, it looks okay. And the engine looks pretty clean. I've looked at the MOT and stuff on it and it looks pretty, like it's had a pretty good life. Um, but yeah, I just, it, the spec is just a bit too low, but three grand for a KN, still four wheel drive, still get me through the winter, but just a little bit too lowly spec for me, I think. But if I struggle to find anything else interesting and I just want to get something quickly, I would go and buy that, to be honest. This is quite a nice car. It's a late 2006 car, so I think the tax would be a little bit more. It's a 4.5S, um, but the paintwork looks like it's in quite good condition. I like that it's on these smaller wheels because smaller wheels generally mean better ride quality. At least this one doesn't have a black interior. Um, it is grey, which is not as good as cream, but it's better than black. It also has an aftermarket head unit thing as well, which uh, it's not a complete turn off. Like if it has Apple CarPlay, then actually that's going to be very useful to me. Um, this one's six grand and it's got 130,000 miles on the clock. It looks like quite a good car. But this is the problem, isn't it? Is that six grand gets you this when it comes to Porsche KNs. But then we know from our previous searches that it will also get you quite a nice Range Rover. And you could almost get into a 4.4 TDV8 at six grand. In fact, you could. 
if you were willing to haggle a little bit. So it is just a bit of a tricky one because obviously your Range Rover is going to be five or six years newer than your KN. And as standard, the spec on, uh, let's just go off a of Vogue SE TDV8. Um, my cat's come to join me, so excuse him. Sorry about that, everyone. A Vogue SE 4.4 TDV8, not on the laptop, please. That will get you heated and cooled front seats, heated rear seats, which not all the KNs have, and I haven't seen any KNs with cooled seats at the front. Um, you have the digital dash, which is nice on the newer um, TDV8 Range Rovers. Lots of other things. Some of them have rear reclining seats, deployable side steps, uh, nice headliner, which the standard S's won't have when it comes to Porsche. So the spec on the Range Rovers is better for the money you pay. Whether they're more or less reliable or not, I'm not too sure. I've not lived with a KN before. The bonus for me having a KN is that I've got really good friends at La Rose Porsche and ePorsche who I could do video content with should the car go wrong. Um, and you know, I trust them and are happy to spend my money with them. Whereas with Range Rover, Land Rover, I don't have uh, like a specialist that I, I am friendly with, so to speak. So there's a couple of things to, to weigh up there. Also, I've had a Range Rover before and I've never had a KN. It is it show on scratch. So at the moment, I would like to end up with a KN. I'm just struggling. I think the problem is I'm struggling to justify a KN when there's so many good Range Rovers out there, particularly at the moment. Obviously, a disadvantage of getting a Range Rover is it looks like I'd be buying a diesel and that's gonna mean I'm gonna have to pay you, Les. But as I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm not really fussed. I mean, if I ended up with a KN, a 4.5, I'd be struggling to get mid-20s MPG, whereas with a 4.4 TDV8 Range Rover, I'm pretty sure with all of my MPG skills, I'd be in the 40s. So uh, there we go. I hope that's been an interesting video to watch along with. I do apologize again, it's like just me sitting at a, a laptop, but I've been cut short a little bit with content because I assumed the Volvo would be back by now, but it is not. I hope you've enjoyed looking through Auto Trader with me. I really want to hear uh, your input on what do you think I should do, considering everything, uh, considering me as well on the channel. I've had a Range Rover before, but would you prefer to see me just in another Range Rover, maybe a TDV8, uh, a 4.4, which I've never had? That's probably what I'd be going for. Or do you want to see me in a KN? And if so, which one? And yeah, also, if, you if you've owned these cars, I want to hear your experiences on them as well. I'll update you on the Volvo when there's something to update you on. Uh, in the meantime, thank you for watching this one and thank you to Car Vertical for sponsoring this video and being a supporter of the channel. It is really appreciated. And um, yeah, until next time, guys, I'll see you all very, very soon.